Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Hope everybody's doing good. We're uh, or doing well even. You might be doing good and doing well. You got doing well to do good. I don't know. English is hard. Uh, so hopefully everybody's doing well. Last week we had a lot of fun. We were talking about synth pedals and had a chat with the marvelous Sarah Hubbard, who's an incredible player, an incredible musician, and just has a lot of really good things to say about uh, synths and life in general. This week we are going a little bit deeper. We're talking some more synth stuff and we are chatting with Matt Manweiler, who's like this, uh, he's a wizard. He's some sort of electronics wizard. He's a, he's a wrangler of electrons. He can make him do all kinds of crazy stuff. And in this effects on violin series, we're like, what did I say? Week 15 now. We probably got another, at least four or five weeks to go. I've got a couple of interviews scheduled this week. I'm excited about and can't wait to bring those to you guys. We're hitting a different effect each week and we're giving some general information on each one of those. This is kind of what we've talked about so far and who our special guest artists have been. Um, it's been a lot of fun for me. It's been a lot of stinking work for me, but it's been a lot of fun and I'm glad that we did this. Um, and like I said, probably another four or five weeks to go. Uh, Matt Manweiler's here. What's up, buddy? So he's here. If you guys have questions in the comments section, he is hanging out on the Facebook side. So if you guys watch this discussion with him and you have any questions about all the stuff that's happening, feel free to dump those in the comments section. And Matt's a smart guy. He can help you answer those questions. So without any further uh, doo doo, we're going to get on with my discussion with Matt. And uh, I'll talk to him for like two seconds, and then we'll hear some examples of things, of things, of things, sings, things that sings with synths. Yeah. I'm just going to let you start talking about this stuff because you understand it way better than I do.
So um, when it comes to modular synthesis and, you know, especially the bowed string world, the first thing that I want to say is it is okay to feel completely overwhelmed and completely confused. Um, I can't tell you the number of times even in the last year with it being as complicated that it is that I've called things by the wrong name, found out that I'm like way out of my depth and have had friends be like, um, you have, you're totally wrong on that. And you know, the Dunning Kruger effect is totally real in this. And it's very easy to catch you in, in this field, but that's okay. Um, I, I want to start off by saying, and I know that Sarah talked about this last week, you know, um, this is not a field where it's like exact replication of perfection. This is a field of open possibilities and, um, making mistakes is okay. This is a playground where we're exploring and no one is going to care if, if you, and this goes for Matt or anyone else in this field, call something by the wrong name or doesn't know every single detail about a circuit or what something does, they're just excited that you're cracking open this door and starting to explore these new sonic possibilities. And everyone that I've worked with in this field is super kind and warm and welcoming. And so, um, so hopefully let, let your anxiety at least be um, not super high in that area because you, do, you don't have to, to show off to anyone on or be fearful of what does this do? Ask questions because there's a lot of stuff I don't know and I've been wrong and corrected. So yeah. So that's a disclaimer there. So, um, but what I wanted to do is starting talking about a little bit of a different way of looking at pedal boards and synths because Sarah and Matt talked last week about some basics of modular synths with, um, what the basic waveforms are, what envelopes are, and what filters are. But I want to try to make sure that everyone has something that they can take to their pedal board, whether or not you go full synth or just have ways to enrich what you're doing. And I like to think of it as um, a linear approach where you plug your instrument in on one end and put all of your effects in a line this way. And then on the other end, you, you plug out to your amplifier or the soundboard versus a much larger um, multiple parallel paths. So you might have your violin coming in here or your cello or your viola, and you'll split it out into multiple areas. They'll all be going at the same time in different directions, and then we'll bring them all together at the end. And that allows us to kind of come up here and bake a cake that tastes this way here and bake something here and kind of do all these changes and then the coolest thing that we'll start seeing is when these things start interacting with each other and whether or not you're going for like a full synthy sound or maybe you are wanting some side compression with your bass player and your drums or you want to take that for your violin when you've dropped down an octave or two octaves and you can pull the signal off of your drummer in your band and do side compression. It's the same type of thinking that we're not just looking at our instruments as um, we're just playing notes, but we're looking at sound and any aspect of sound, whether it's the reverb that we can use or whatever else, we're going to go for that. And anything's fair game. We can take our pedals, we can change the orders of them. We can plug things in in weird orders. It's all open for experimenting. So, so that's kind of the basic starting point of where we're going today. So, that sounds awesome. It's like a whole different way of thinking about that for me. Yeah, and so one of the things that I like to talk about first is some of the ways that we can control this because it's a lot of people focus first, I think, on ooh, this pedal sounds really cool. And I think getting our signal chain under control is more important. I would probably, personally, if I had to have a bunch of basic pedals, but have like a lot of really good ways to route them creatively, 
I'd probably take that pedal board over maybe a pedal board that had like one or two quote fancy synthy type pedals on it. Um, and so one of the, the ways that we can do that is through things like matrix routers. And if you've never heard about that, Matt will be putting up a slide that will show some matrix routing options. Um, Morningstar makes this really cool MIDI controlled router where you can have all of your pedals plugged in and you can send it a MIDI message and it can change the order of all of your pedals connected. You can connect it to your Helix and a lot of the Helix blocks can change as well. And Matt, are you using any of the effect sends on your Helix currently? Yes, I use uh, one of them for an electroharmonics pedal, the C9 pedal. So, and what a lot of people may not realize is, so like if you're in the Helix ecosystem, you have four effect sends on your Helix floor or two stereo sends, and that can be routed any place in your Helix um, ecosystem. And especially if you get a, a effect pedal that's MIDI controlled, and one of my favorite pedals, and you're gonna be seeing this one featured a lot today, is the Raster 2. And the Raster 2 has a control port um, for MIDI information and a USB port that can be used to control it or for MIDI information as well. And with that, um, we can have the Helix send it the same information that it sends any of the blocks in your Helix. So if you think of when you're looking for pedals that are doing really cool stuff and you have maybe three or four options, but one of them has better control and can connect to your current ecosystem, think about the control options on that. Um, and so some of the control that we'll be looking at, um, I wanted to kind of go back into history just a little bit. Um, and this was my very first um, filter that I ever got. This is a Moger Foger low pass filter. And this is really cool because it has a drive control built into it. So this could be a good drive pedal if you wanted to it. And just to put it in perspective a size, these things are huge. They're heavy, but they sound great. There's not a better sounding low pass filter. But on the back end, there are all these um, inputs for what we call control voltage, which is the higher the voltage is, it's like taking your expression pedal and having it in tow position. The lower the voltage is, it's like that. But on this one, I have the cutoff, the mix, resonance, and amount on being able to control this here. And in addition to that, what Bob Moog did is he also released his Moger Foger control processor. And he has all these different ways that you can route this. And these are guitar effect pedal um, the series. Sadly, these are out of production today. But this idea where you can be like, I want to um, take kind of the cutoff on that wah um, and a low pass filter connect just like the wah and maybe make it a little bit crazier and a little bit bigger, faster than my foot can sweep. We just, you know, take some cables, plug it in and do that. Um, and, you know, so he has this whole ecosystem of filters. Sorry if that's banging there. I'm trying to reach around and get them, including probably my um, favorite special weapon filter, the Murph. And you can see we still have all these, I know it's out of focus here, but all these um, pedals there. And the Murph has all these lovely sliders on it. So um, Moog kind of set up these really great options for guitarists. Um, and I got my first one, gosh, over 20 years ago, I think. Um, and it's been just exploring ever since. So you got it when you were one? Yep. <laughs> I hide my age well. So, and then um, when we're looking at other ways to control these these pedals, and this is going to make sense once we get into some of these more complicated patches, because the more complicated you get, you really have to to have ways to to tame the stuff. Otherwise, it's just going to go out of control. Um, the Korg SQ1 is a sequencer that's about. 120 bucks 
and it has little knobs that you can kind of sequence pitches and stuff like that or sequence any parameter on a pedal that you want and i really like this one and i use it occasionally not all the time because i have other ways to sequence stuff but it has a midi output so you can sequence midi with it which is really cool and you can also sequence the control voltage and i have a few different ranges um this one pairs really well with the chase bliss pedals such as like the chase bliss mood 2 the reverse mode c or any of the other fun um chase bliss things that um we can talk a lot about and it also does a good job syncing up with the zoya and that whole ecosystem as well which is another one of my favorite things i don't know that we're gonna have time to talk about zoya today but I would say, like, fan. use your imagination and pretend that I'm really stupid and I don't know what sequencing different things means. And we're going to be getting into that in a little bit. I have some some demonstrations here. Uh, I'm going to play a quick example for you of a sequence where I have taken my violin and I've frozen it in the buffer with a pedal that just kind of does a freeze of it, and then. This um, sequencer was going to send out control voltages. And every single one of these knobs here, um, I can go and tune um, every step on it. And then there's a clock. And however fast the clock is, it'll kind of go through each of the steps on it. So I can choose whether I have four steps or eight steps. And this one goes up to 16 steps. Um, and you'll hear the pitch changing in the sequence. Um, of this example, I'm not actually playing any different notes. This is, I had one note, I froze it, and then the sequencer is going to take over. So it's a way to create more in-depth harmony without actually doing the work of playing the additional notes. You're going to see some other things happening in this patch as well, which we'll hopefully get to later. Um, game sounds huh <laughs> yeah it reminds me of my childhood man i'm a kid of the 80s and so that pedal is one of my favorite pedals the the chase bliss mood 2 which is in the granular synthesis world of things and um it stacks really well with with other pedals and it sequences well and um so sequencing is a huge big picture thing that you can do and as we start to get more complicated, you'll see sequencing used in a lot of different ways for that. Now, Matt, have you done any sequencing in your kind of more traditional rock stuff? Has it been in post when you've done it or live? Or how have you seen that used before? Um, I haven't really done a lot of it other than I played around in Reason a lot for a few years and was using some of the sequencers in Reason just to kind of make crazy sounds. Um, haven't done it much in the rock world, though. Okay. And this can be done in post-production. It can be done live. I like to do these things live and find ways to recreate these. So it's just me and, and you know, the, the pedals and, and the, the, um, these instruments. I, I, I'm going to call them instruments because the, the pedal board is an extension of your instrument. Um, and there's there's hours and hours and hours of, sequencing talk that we can get into um, especially once we get into some of the software synths that exist out there um, so let's go ahead and jump to some other categories that i think are good foundational talk which is bouncing off of the 
envelope talks from last week. So Matt and Sarah covered talking about envelopes and how there is the attack, you know, the sustain and the release of the envelopes. Um, there's a decay time as well in there. Um, and go back and review that video if you haven't seen it yet. But if you looked at my video that I just posted, there's a delay called reverse mode C. And I am a huge fan of reverse delays. And Rob Flax is also a big fan of reverse delays. And he's actually the one that finally talked me into getting reverse mode C. It's a delightful delay pedal. But so quick question, Matt, in the straight ahead rock world, where have you seen reverse delays be used? Um, I've used them just sort of as an effect if I'm doing like a, a pits thing. That's generally where I'll use it. In, in the rock world, you hear a lot of it on uh, snare drums, reverse uh, reverbs okay. and stuff on snare drums. I know Coldplay had it on the, the, their album. I think it was Strawberry Hill, Hill with Viva La Vida. They had a really good um, guitar that was just kind of turned inside out on that one. But if we're thinking of pizzicato and we have a sharp attack and then it kind of tapers off this way here and we turn it around and we're thinking in envelopes, we can have a really gentle build and then a really sharp cutoff and it gives us a really cool sound. And there's a few different ways that we can flip this. We can go to a synthesizer and we can create that envelope in a synthesizer or we can take our reverse delay and we can flip it around in our delay pedal um, and get a similar type of effect. And I'm going to have Matt play a video here where I'm going to build um, some delays up and you'll hear some octave pitch shifts happening as well. And they'll be flipped backwards and forwards in a loop and then put through a delay pedal that also flips them. And so you'll kind of hear this backwards and forwards play on them. So you can see there are a lot of cool things that can be done with pizzicato and reversing them in the string world. Um, and then when we take a drone and we can kind of pull sections out and reverse that as well. So sequencing and then adding drones with that is an incredibly powerful tool that we have. Um, don't be afraid to use pizzicato. I think a lot of string players feel like they always have to use their bow. And I think since pizzicato is how a lot of classical players started playing and then they graduated the bow, I think there's, there's this kind of hesitation to do that because 
it's it's for beginners but it's pizzicato is a wonderful thing and it's a great textural change that you can do so especially if you can develop some like guitar like finger plucking technique joe denizone and rob flax are two of the people i respect the most in that territory it's fun to watch them do those techniques there so and believe it or um, not, if it makes sense, you're it's it's totally legal to use a pick. Oh, very legal. You just have to watch that you don't rip your your string off of your bridge, which I have done before. And especially if you're on one of the Zetas that has like that the old style with that like like raised bridge like that. And I do a lot of my pizzicato playing in guitar position, so I can use that finger style, um, kind of classical guitar technique. And I'm normally three finger. I am trying to get a four finger technique so I can get more strings engaged, but um, it's, it just gives you more options. And, you know, we're thinking of sound as envelopes and um, yeah. So, but let's move on for, for the sake of time, because we have a very deep world to, to try to, to cover here. And um, I want to quickly talk about a few of the programs that are out there that, um, will prevent you from having to spend tens of thousands of dollars on equipment. And one of them is called VCB Rack. And what VCB Rack is, it's a Euro Rack um, kind of environment. And Euro Rack, to back up just a little bit, is the modular synth kind of framework that, that most people are are jumping to today. There's there's a few different kind of sizes of modules out there, but your rack is where most of the people are are spending their time now. And you will have racks that will be or sorry, modules that will be anywhere between, you know, a hundred bucks for a small one to hundreds of dollars for a small one. And that's for a single module. And then you start piecing together these systems and you can easily be looking at something that's a size of you know, a, a big, big room and can cost as much as a house, depending on where you go. And you'll see these in, you know, movie production studios. Um, the Dune movie score had a huge Euro rack that was used in the writing of that movie as well. But VCV rack is a software emulation and it has one-to-one, -one, um, analog digital, um, emulations of modules that exist in the real world. And it is free. You can download it to your computer. You can plug your violin into it and you can play through it as an effects pedal and you can start to build or play around and experiment. And as of last night, I have 3000 modules on my, my VCV Eurac system. And there's more that I don't have that I've not downloaded. Now, when I say it's free, most of it's free. There are some premium upgrades and it's open source. So there's a huge um, community of developers that are constantly adding to this. You're going to see a lot of examples that will have this like cables going everywhere. That is the Euro Rack Simulator VCV Rack. So I highly recommend you check that out. Um, and there's some amazing channels there. Um, I'm going to start on my YouTube channel having some content on how to get started in that for bowed string players so is it time and matt to dive into some of the insanity that happened at acid two weeks ago yeah i think it's time for that it's a good time oh. always a good time for insanity okay so so two weeks ago i was in asta or at asta in um kentucky and i performed a piece the piece was called migraine and um i purposely used a lot of elements in this piece and it was overly complicated on purpose um so some of it went well some of it i have ways to improve on if i perform it again but um i've had a lot of questions on how some of these effects and sounds were made and the first of which now that you ha have some background on we can sequence some notes and we can um, do some cool things with pizzicato. Um, I want to talk about how I get some of my bass lines from um, solo violin playing. And one of my favorite effects pedals is the plus 
Sustainer by Game Changer Audio. And Matt, you did a video on that, was it a year ago or so? Yeah, it was a little while back. It was, uh, it's a pretty cool pedal. It's basically like a piano sustain pedal. Do you know what my favorite feature is on, on the, the Plus Sustainer? I'm sure I would never guess. It has an effects loop out on it. So with that, and I love effects that can, can interact with other effects. And that's going to be as we kind of go forward and talking about, hopefully to give you some ideas on what you can do. Um, anything that we can kind of like have interacting with each other in a strange way, whether it's um, a conventional means or not, that's where we're going to kind of find these weird and crazy sounds. So um, this video um, that I'm going to provide an example of, um, we're, we're going to use a game changer audio and the effects loop out. And normally people are like putting like chorus or reverbs um, or other fun things there. I put a pitch shifter in there and I think it was the pitch fork by um, Electro Harmonics. And then I sequenced that. Now, to sequence that, the pitchfork only uses expression foot controller stuff. It doesn't use conventional control voltage, and it doesn't use MIDI language. So sometimes you will find a pedal that has like almost everything you're looking for, but you need to go one step further. And there's some tools out there, and one of my favorite ones is Old Blood Noise Endeavors has this midi it's it's called the mtet midi 2 expression trans transmitter i forget what the, the acronym is but it will take midi signal and then translate that to expression pedal control so any pedal that has expression pedal control you can now feed it midi data from your helix or any other midi sequencer and you can sequence that so on that pedal i could sequence it with this guy here which was upside down the korg sq1 or in this case i think i was using the vcv rack and then we can get pitch information going through that and um instead of the pitch going which is how most people use the um the expression pedal it can be stepped which is really nice and then um, i'll do a couple other fun things with that as well
from one note. All that from one note and, and just frozen in the, the freeze pedal and then just manipulated the heck out of. That's right. So one note. Now, that is a lot, a lot of modular trickery to get that. But um, that's, that's one note in, in the buffer frozen. And um, I stopped following the process, you know, after I got the kick drum there. But um, I'm wanting to show that once you start seeing how these filters work and, and start learning things, you can do a lot of cool things with the violin. That patch is totally playable live. And you can then mix your violin over on this channel and have your violin going. You have your kick drum bass over here and then you're playing here. You don't even have to use a freeze um, effect on that. You could have that kick drum coming straight from your violin and that bass line um, and you could just play it this way. The cool thing that I like about these like sequence bass lines though is A, they they sound very synthy, you know, and, and it kind of has this like the modular synth feeling of, hey, we can create in these cool recipes, but it tracks how you're playing. All you need is like half a second to grab a new note that you're playing. And then you can have like a one, four, five, one following you wherever you're playing. And as a solo, so, solo player, um, you, you can have that reinforcement. Now, this wouldn't work with a six piece rock band to have this much sound taken up but for some things this works very nicely or for post-production on an album you know getting in and, and really having some fun with you know mixing up the sonic space there i would guess i would want to talk about ways that we can take our violins when we have oscillators that are tracking our pitch and it, i think there's a a shortcoming that they have. And I think it's very similar to if you have a MIDI, in, like a MIDI violin, and you're getting a clarinet sound, we lose a lot of the articulation that we get with our bow. And there's both pluses of having, you know, a really cool synth sound with that, but losing that, um, that bow articulation. So it, my first question is, Matt, you were talking last week about how you had to adjust your playing for the Denizone Violin Concerto when you had the synth. How much did you miss kind of the articulation element of your bow? Yeah, for in a really short section, not too bad. But if I was going to be playing more than probably 15 or 20 seconds of, of that, and especially if I was going to be improvising, I would definitely feel like well, I'd don't you know why am i even playing the violin here and so that i think is a very real issue for violin players who are looking at synth pedals and and sarah and i were talking about this because i think there's a fatigue that that sets in for all of us when we're like there are these cool sounds you get a, a really cool synth pedal and then you put your violin with it and then all of a sudden all these nuances that you're used to just like you know, just moving just a little bit there. It just doesn't respond. Um, I'm not going to be able to tap into all of this today, but I do want to start talking a little bit of how we can address some of that. Um, and the first thing is, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and we can still get some some synth sounds. And the, the first thing is, um, a lot of synth pedals will have that like, um, mix knob on it which is is the first level i don't always love that because you still have the violin coming through and the whole point of going to synth is to to not sound like the violin i think so um but if we can take our pedals and split them up to like two completely different signal chains that's a nice thing to do um and then if we can take maybe the second pedal and run it or sorry the second signal path and run it through a pedal chain that maybe is a little bit more responsive. Um, Matt, how do you feel that a fuzz pedal is at responding to your bow changes? Yeah, you you get some. I mean, because it's basically slamming it into a square wave, you do lose some, um, you do lose some control over it, but you, uh, 
I feel like maybe I've got more than I did on some of those synth sounds. How about uh, more of like a drive pedal? Yeah, drive pedal for sure. Yeah, I've got basically full control with that. So I would say there's a spectrum. Like, so if we have our synth here and then we do a separate signal path over here, which is maybe, let's say, a drive type pedal, maybe fuzz or drive. And depending on how much control you need to add in, the, the fuzz is going to be the most synth-like. Um, especially if you run it direct with no speaker sims. Um, I would say, especially if you run it direct and then maybe put a chorus directly after it, that's a really cool sound. Um, but having that parallel signal path, which the Helix does really, really well, and I, I talk about the Helix a lot because Matt's on the Helix, and I think it's probably the most common um, ecosystem, but the Helix can do four parallel stereo pass at the same time if you know how to set it up before you even bring in the external loops um and you can do it that way there and the fuzz pedal is it will give you a little bit of an edge and that just might be enough to take that fatigue away the drive pedal will be a little bit more violin-y but it i feel that if you're going to be playing for long periods of time that might be more of a solution one of the other solutions, though, um, that I don't think a lot of people talk about is hard sync on oscillators. And if you look at um, a modular synth, there's a lot of different ways to control these oscillators. And this is why having the VCB rack that you can plug things into, um, you don't even have to have pitching tracked on the oscillator in the traditional synth since talking is hard apparently um i'm gonna play a video here really quickly where um i don't have any pitch tracking on the oscillator i think i do have have some on the filters here and this is going to get some really gnarly sounds but it does respond to your bow and it does respond to double stops really well not quite like a polyphonic synth but it's going to pick up kind of on that like that grit that double stops have so So what are we hearing with that? So what's happening is the oscillator, every time the, 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 the threshold of zero is crossed by the waveform comes, and every oscillator handles it slightly differently, it kind of resets the waveform a little bit. So if you have a saw wave on it, it kind of resets it a little bit. Um, it is a pretty dirty sounding waveform. I don't like to use these personally without filters, or by themselves. I like to put them in the mix with other things. But if we have, let's say, a pitch tracking oscillator here, and you do a hard synced or soft synced oscillator, there's a lot of digging into those that we could do. Um, that's a pairing that we can do that can give you some more ways to get some of that more depth with the bow on that. Um, so if you're feeling like you're having that fatigue with with your bow and you're just like man it's just i i lost that that element you know i mean i think all of us when we heard oh midi violin we can sound like all these cool instruments it sounded really cool at the beginning and then you we just lost something about 10 minutes in um and it doesn't have to be that way and there's so many cool sounds, but you can take a dirty sound like that and you're like, oh, I can filter it. I can take a low pass filter or a band pass filter and, and really clean it up some other ways like that. So don't be terrified of that type of sound at first. We can always stick it in the mix it and really clean it up some other ways. But that's that's a type of sound that I'd be looking for to 
reduce the fatigue a lot. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have happening. So the other thing that I also like doing is just not using oscillators. Um, there's other ways to get really cool sounds, just taking the sound of your violin and mutilating it a couple different ways, which I'm a huge fan of ring modulation and frequency shifting. And most people hear ring modulation and they've only heard it used in really nasty ways, not realizing that you have to tune it. Um, and just know if you're, if you're ever planning to use ring modulation, you're going to have to tune it. Otherwise it's going to sound like death. Um, and frequency shifting is like ring modulation. Um, I think it's has a little bit more of a musical use, but, um, I'm going to pull up a quick video of my favorite delay pedal at, at the moment, the raster two which is a pitch shifting, reverse delay, frequency shifting delay pedal to show you what um, frequency shifting can do to get you some really cool synthy sounds. So tell us some more about that. So what the frequency shifting does, it, it ring modulation um, takes the harmonics and it shifts them one way. Um, and freak, uh, the frequency shifting does it a slightly different way using math. Um, I, I'm not going to get into too much of an analysis right now, but um, it gets us some sounds that can sound metallic or a little gritty or maybe a little distortion sounds. And I like it. It kind of sounds like a little, um, some percussion instruments at times. I think it pairs really well with um, pizzicato and it gives you a little bit of a grit on your bow as well. Um, and you also heard some like reverse delays that were pitched up and down coming in and out of that. And that was a sound that came from three effect pedals. Um, you don't always need this huge spaceship to get some cool sounds out of it. It's fun to do that from time to time, but, um, you know, it's, it's always good to, to, to experiment on both sides of the spectrum on that. So um, frequency shifting is a really expressive way that will follow your bow and follow your pizzicato. And if you are feeling that fatigue when you're coming in and being like, Ugh, it's just... I, I get burned out because I do, I do get burned out when I'm playing those, um, just the standard pitch tracking synth pedals. All right. And then the final thing is of, of kind of the prepared parts that I have is, um, I want to encourage people to think about changing the conventional order of what, what effects are and thinking of sound is not just what's coming out of your violin, but, but the whole environment. So reverb is traditionally thought of as like, it's at the end of the chain. And a lot of people think of that as something of, we don't touch that, that's at the end. Um, but I, I'm i like, why not put that at the beginning of the chain? Why not look at ways that sound, that, that gets us some cool things to do. We can filter anything. We can put an envelope filter on anything. So if we get a sound that's a little too aggressive, we can always tame it. So um, this next video um, is going to be reverb. 
fed into a distortion, fed into a filter and an envelope, then fed into reverb again. And I'm writing a, a foot controller to kind of control the amount of feed that's going into the distortion. And you get this really big cinematic sound out of that. And you can control how aggressive it is just by um, the toe position. Um, I wouldn't recommend this for, you know, fast um, moving lines, but you know, this has, this has its place. So again, that's, that's a free, free program, program and you can explore anything you want to. So I, I can't recommend BCV Rack enough. You don't have to have all 3000 modules there. You can start with the basic set of, I think it's like 60, which is plenty to get going. But, oh, it's it's so great to figure out what's what's happening in this world. Now, I know we said, like, this is the last thing, but we can always do one more last thing. Tell us about this granular uh, symphony orchestra that you've got. Okay, so granular synthesis. Um, let me back up just a little bit. Um, last week, we started on subtractive synthesis, which is, I think, a good foundation for synth synthesis talk. But there's at least 10 different types of synthesis out there. You know, there's subtractive synthesis, there's um, frequency modulation, there's, you know, all these different types. This gets into granular synthesis where the idea is we take a sample of, of your sound and it could be as small as a few milliseconds or as long as maybe a second. And we will pitch shift that up or down, um, maybe flip it backwards um, and then layer many copies of that on top of it. So if you have a hundred instances of five milliseconds of your violin playing, you can create a seamless sound of your violin that still has a tonality of your violin. So what I did in this patch here is I created a symphony of violins. By the way, um, this this patch I'm using a emulation of a model called clouds which is an open source euro rack module but there are very wonderful pedals that do this that i would highly highly recommend any string player check out um, including red pandas particle 2 um, and matt can probably throw up a list of popular granular delays granular reverbs and granular harmonizers but the advantage here is it keeps the tonality and your overtone series intact better than any other um, pedal out there. So um, here is the granular orchestra.
pretty sweet. It's fun. This is just a big playground, and and that's that's what it's all about. Is just going in and exploring, having fun, and the, the stuff that you like best out of your experiments might make it to an audience or might not. But it's go and explore. Well, thanks for taking the time to explain all this stuff to us. Where can people find you and your music? And, and like, if they've got more questions, how can people find you? I have a YouTube channel called Manueller Music, and I'm also the Education Programs Director for Jesus Florido and at Latin Fiddler Music. Um, and you can email me at manweiler at gmail.com. So... Um, and, you know, there's there's a, a small community of us, you know, bow string players that nerd out about this synthesizer stuff. But there's a very large community of synthesizer people out there. So even if even if you, if you feel like you can't connect with people in your area that are necessarily string players, there are probably people in your area that like this stuff that you can learn from um, or there's always the Internet. So. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for doing this. And uh, it was great to be able to hang with you uh, a week or so ago in Louisville. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to hang again real soon. Yeah, thank you. All right, everybody. That was my friend, Matt Manweiler. Got a lot of really good stuff to say about synths with violins and um, yeah, impressive stuff. He has been in the comments section both here on Facebook and here on YouTube, depending on which platform you're watching on. Uh, so he's been good about answering those questions. He knows the answers to these things. I don't. So that is what's going on this week. That's why we had Matt do all the teaching, because he actually knows what he's talking about. Uh, we are getting some more interviews right now for the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to talk about, we are going to be talking about fuzz uh, very soon, and you can probably guess who the interviewee is for that. We are going to be talking about different instruments. I know it's technically an effects on violin series, but when you talk to guitar players, they all have multiple guitars, and the reason for that is because they're all different. So we're going to be talking to someone who is a gigging musician who owns like a bunch of violins. We will talk to this person about why they use those different violins and when they would choose each one and how they order their effects and how they change their effects based on which violin they have. We will also be talking to someone about how to uh, sort of combine all this knowledge that we've gathered about different effects and say, if I've got a sound that I'm trying to get, how do I go after uh, duplicating that sound. You know, what is what is a process for doing that? And we're talking to an artist that you will have definitely have seen before. And uh, their work is really impressive and looking forward to hearing their thoughts on, you know, how do I sort of combine all this knowledge that I've got? I hear a sound. I want to sound like that. How do I, uh, what's, what's the process for chasing after that? So we've got a few more things coming for you. Uh, we're going to be talking to someone about the Eventide system, the Eventide H9, which is kind of its own whole uh, ecosystem, its whole world. Uh, what else? We've got probably somebody we're talking to about modulation effects. And yeah, we've got a few more things coming. So right now I've got three interviews in the next few days uh, that I will be bringing you over the next uh, couple weeks. So more and more stuff coming. I'm excited about all that. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys uh, here next week. Matt Manweiler, thank you so much for all your time and expertise in answering all these questions and all the work that you put together to, uh, to generate the content that we just watched for nearly an hour. So hopefully that's been really helpful for everybody. Uh, it's, uh, I learned a lot. So anyway, thank you guys all. And I will see you uh, next week.